Friedrich Nietzsche. Probably one of the most influential thinkers of the whole 19th century. He is a milestone in human history, for during the time of Nietzsche, the whole of Western society took a great turn. So welcome to the first chapter in this series, and we're beginning here. So here, in the small village of Raken, 1844, Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche was born. And at that time in history, this part of Germany was part of the Kingdom of Prussia. Nietzsche's mother, Franziska Nietzsche, was a teacher, and his father, Karl Ludwig Nietzsche, was a Lutheran pastor. His father being a pastor has quite the symbolic meaning, which you will understand later. Nietzsche had a younger brother, Ludwig Joseph Nietzsche, and a younger sister, Elizabeth Nietzsche. But at the age of four, Nietzsche's father passed away. And only six months afterwards, also their brother died. Here Nietzsche writes in his autobiography. My father died at the age of 36. He was delicate, lovable and morbid, like one who is preordained to pay simply a flying visit, a gracious reminder of life rather than life itself. The death of the father had of course great impact on the Nietzsche family, so they decided to move here to Naumburg, a couple of miles from Röcken, where Friedrich's grandmother lived. Nietzsche supposedly was an excellent student as a child. According to his grades, he excelled in subjects such as Christian theology, ironically. In 1854, Nietzsche attended the Dom Gymnasium here in Naumburg. And later, Nietzsche received a scholarship to the prestigious school of Schulpforta. As you can see, Nietzsche is not the only famous philosopher who received an education here. And here, Nietzsche's love for poetry and music would grow. He even composed a couple of pieces himself. So here I am at the school of Schulpforta, a school that lies next to a monastery. And it was here that Nietzsche learned Latin, Hebrew, Greek, but also French. In September of 1864, aged 20, Nietzsche moved to Bonn to continue his study in not just theology, but also classical philology. So it was at the University of Bonn, Nietzsche began to lose his faith in Christianity after reading critical texts on the Bible. And now Nietzsche's faith in Christianity began to dwindle. What you should know is that this is only five years after Charles Darwin released his book on the origin of the species, which probably was the heaviest blow on the Christian way of life. The hardest part of the origin of the species was not the fact about evolution, that we had evolved from apes, it could still be compatible with a Christian lifestyle, but the theory of evolution showed that God simply didn't care about us. Everything is a brutal fight for survival in this world. Either you win or you die. So Nietzsche dropped out of the University of Bonn and decided to move here to the great city of Leipzig to focus on philology instead. And here he would meet some very influential people. What's the difference of philosophy and philology, you may ask? Well, strictly translated, philologia means a lover of words, 
but academically at the time, it was a study and an analysis of ancient texts. So Nietzsche, at least in the beginning, didn't see himself as a philosopher. There was especially one person that would come to affect Friedrich very much that he met here in Leipzig. And it was no other than the composer Richard Wagner at the house of Hermann Brockhaus, Richard Wagner's brother-in-law. One curious fact is that Hermann Brockhaus was an expert on ancient Persian religion and culture. He wrote a book on the Vendidad, which is the holy text for Mazdaism, whose prophet was Zoroaster, or as we may call him, Zarathustra. Is this a coincidence? During his time here in Leipzig, Nietzsche encountered the texts of a philosopher that would change his view of many things. And the philosopher is probably one of the most pessimistic persons ever lived. And yes, it's Arthur Schopenhauer. Arthur Schopenhauer was born in 1788 in the city formerly called Danzig, now Gdansk. He grew up in Hamburg, but later in life he studied at Göttingen, Berlin and Jena, where he achieved his doctorate. Schopenhauer was highly influenced by Eastern religion and philosophies. His most famous work is called The World as Will and Representation. He died in the year 1860, age 72. Nietzsche learned a great deal from Schopenhauer. Even one of his texts is called Schopenhauer as a teacher. And a couple of key concepts from Schopenhauer lives on in Nietzsche. In the year of 1869, Friedrich became a professor here at the University of Basel, only being 24 years old. He is still to this day one of the youngest persons to ever hold such a position. Before moving to Basel, Nietzsche had renounced his Prussian citizenship. But soon the Franco-Prussian War would break out in 1870 and Nietzsche insisted upon serving. This decision to partake in the war would come to change him. Not only in his philosophy of war and struggle, but some people speculate that at this time in the war is where he contracted syphilis from a brothel, which will lead to dire consequences later in his life. After the war, Friedrich came back here to Basel, and it's now that Friedrich's own philosophy is really taking form. And at the same time, his friendship with Richard Wagner grew stronger. He very often visited Wagner here, where he lived in Tribschen, just outside the city of Lucerne, in Switzerland. Wagner was a major celebrity at the time, so here in Tribschen was a big meeting place of the European high society. So here Nietzsche met such celebrities such as Franz Liszt. Here Nietzsche says in his autobiography, This, without the slightest doubt, was my intimate relationship with Richard Wagner. All my other relationships with the men I treat quite lightly. But I would not have the days I spent at Tribschen, those days of confidence, 
of cheerfulness, of sublime flashes, and of profound moments blotted from my life at any price. I know not what Wagner may have been for others, but no cloud ever darkened our sky. In 1872, Nietzsche published his first major work, Geburt der Tragödie, or The Birth of Tragedy. We will discuss this book in depth in the next episode. But in The Birth of Tragedy is really where Nietzsche's own philosophy is born. It is a deep analysis of pre-Socratic culture with a focus on the spirit of Dionysus. But especially it is a break off from the pessimistic philosophy of Schopenhauer. He agreed with Schopenhauer on many points, but he could not stand the pessimism. To him, pessimism is a great denial of life, a philosophy of nihilism. Nietzsche wanted to create a new kind of philosophy that was a, an affirmation of life, a big yes to life. And he found that in the Greek tragedy and in the music of Wagner. Friedrich visited the great festival in Bayreuth. It is a big celebration of opera and music. But Nietzsche became very disappointed. For Wagner had become something that Nietzsche loathed, a Reich Deutsch, to use his own term, a celebrator of a unified German culture. He became like Otto von Bismarck's poster boy. So Nietzsche decided to distance himself from Wagner. What is it that I have never forgiven Wagner? The fact that he condescended to the Germans, that he became a German imperialist. Wherever Germany spreads, she ruins culture. Nietzsche returned here to Basel to resume his writing and teaching. But now he's living with his sister Elizabeth and his friend Peter Gast. But now Friedrich's health is dwindling and it's most likely the first stages of the syphilis he contracted during the war. During this time he spent a lot of time writing on one of his major works, Human All Too Human. It is a big critique of what he himself saw being wrong with Europe during his own time. By the time of the release of the second volume of Human, All Too Human, Nietzsche's health was getting worse and worse. So he decided to resign his position as professor at the University of Basel. But fortunately, he received a very good pension. And here marks a shift in Friedrich's life. He began to live like a nomad, moving from city to city, Basel, to Riva, to Marienbad, back to Naumburg, to Stresa, Genoa, and then he found one of his favorite places. Namely here, in the middle of the Swiss Alps, in a small village called Sils Maria, not far from the famous ski resort of St. Moritz. Sils Maria was one of Nietzsche's favorite places in the world. And this is the very house that he used to live in when he was here. He really did enjoy this place, and I really do see why. Here he writes to one of his friends. Well, my dear old friend, I am once more in the upper Engadin, 
This is my third visit to the place, and once again I feel that my proper refuge and home is here and nowhere else. This place must have been one of his greatest sources of inspiration. There are so many texts that Nietzsche signs with Sils Maria, so here in this room he used to sit and write his books. And according to Nietzsche himself, he had one of the greatest revelations here in Sils Maria. 6,000 feet beyond man and time. That day I happened to be wandering through the woods alongside of the lake of Silva Plana, and I halted not far from Surle beside a huge rock that towered aloft like a pyramid. It was then that the thought struck me. Nietzsche loved to walk around here in Sils Maria. And here, next to this rock, it is said that he had his grandest ideas that would be a cornerstone in his very philosophy. It is the eternal reoccurrence, a concept we will dig deep into in the upcoming episodes. Friedrich continues to live like a nomad around Europe. And one day he decided to meet up in Rome with one of his dear friends, Dr. Paul Rey. And here he met the love of his life, Lou Salome, a woman who had already turned down Paul Rey's proposal of marriage, but Nietzsche couldn't help but to fall in love. So back here in Lausanne, at this very spot, Nietzsche decided to propose to Lou. But just like his friend, he got turned down. Lou tried to explain to Nietzsche that she saw herself as a modern woman with a modern living and that she shouldn't be a slave under some husband. But still, she got married in 1887. Make that, make out of that as you wish. Nietzsche spent a number of times here in the Italian city of Genoa, a place where his grandest idea would reveal itself to him. Nietzsche used to come here to the place of Rapallo, not far from the city of Genoa where the grandest of spirits would come to him. I lived the following winter, the pleasantly quiet bay of Rapallo, not far from Genoa, which sits in between Chiavari and Promontori of Portofino. My health was not of the best, the winter cold and exceedingly wet. It was during this winter, and under these unfavorable conditions, that my Zarathustra came into existence. So in the year of 1883, Friedrich published the first two parts of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It is quite an odd book, filled with symbols and parables but it contains probably one of the most dangerous ideas that Nietzsche ever had, and that is the idea of the übermensch, or the overman. For Nietzsche, Zarathustra and the übermensch was a big affirmation of life, a celebration, the very opposite of the pessimism of Schopenhauer. But there sure still was a lot in the Western society Nietzsche loathed. In the year 1886, Nietzsche published his book Beyond Good and Evil. If Zarathustra was a positive force, an affirmation, then Beyond Good and Evil certainly was a negative force. It is a list of what Nietzsche saw was wrong with Europe at his time.
In his own time, Friedrich never received fame and fortune. He was barely read by anyone during the 19th century. He decided to publish Beyond Good and Evil himself, which resulted in just about a hundred copies. His next book, On the Genealogy of Morals, that he wrote in just three weeks, was almost like a cry for help. He saw it as a way to promote his older books. Here he writes to his former publisher. Maybe this short polemic will lead to the purchase of a few copies of my old writings. During the same year of Nietzsche writing the genealogy of morals, he began corresponding with a George Brands from Copenhagen. If you remember my first episode on Kierkegaard, I have a quote from George Brands. And he was one of the first people to teach the philosophy of Søren Kierkegaard. And he urged Nietzsche to read Søren's work. And Nietzsche even said that he would visit Copenhagen so they could read it together, which unfortunately never happened. For some reason in the year 1888, Friedrich's health actually improved. So that year he wrote diligently. He finished the books The Case of Wagner, The Twilight of the Idols and Ecce Homo, his very strange autobiography. During the last part of that year, Nietzsche decided to live here in the great city of Turin, actually at this very address. But soon, things are going to make a turn for the worse. I took again the same accommodation I had occupied in the spring, via Carlo Alberto VI, opposite to the mighty Palazzo Corignano, in which Vittorio, beyond that to the hills. Without delay and without letting myself be distracted for a moment, I resumed work. On the 30th September, a great victory. Seventh day, a god takes his leisure on the banks of the Po. But now, the disaster was inevitable. The illness finally got the best of him. On January the 3rd, 1889, Nietzsche was taken by the authorities. A curious story is often told about that day, when Nietzsche left his home here in Turin, he encountered a man whipping his horse so violently that he decided to intervene out of pity. Defending an animal out of pity doesn't seem odd at all, but to Nietzsche it is because in his philosophy he is strictly against pity. Pity is a sign of weakness. His illness just became worse and worse. There are accounts of him dancing stark naked in his room in Turin and playing the piano furiously in the night. And the letters he wrote was either signed as Dionysus or as Der Gekreuzigte, the Crucified One. So after all this, Nietzsche was brought back here to Basel, where he ended up in an insane asylum. There were people here in Basel who thought they could cure Nietzsche. But in 1890, Friedrich's mother decided to bring him home to Naumburg. So there he lived for seven years until his mother died in 1897. After the death of Nietzsche's mother, Elizabeth took over the care of his brother and moved him here to the city of Weimar where now, the Nietzsche archive still exists today. You will 
probably say that Elizabeth didn't treat his brother with respect. You can almost say that he made his brother into a circus attraction, selling tickets for people to watch the great philosopher gone mad. Elizabeth would bring people over and they would sit around here playing games and hearing Nietzsche upstairs grunting and growling. Between the years of 1898 and 1900, Nietzsche suffered from at least three strokes. And finally, the last one killed him on the 25th of August, 1900. So now, here he lies next to his mother and father. Friedrich Nietzsche influences us still today. A great and dangerous thinker, some of his thoughts became slogans for the National Socialist Party in Germany, an ideology Nietzsche himself would have appalled. Friedrich foresaw that his ideas would shake the very foundation of Western society, and he knew that he was bound to be misinterpreted. Here comes a quote from his autobiography. I know my destiny. There will come a day when my name will recall the memory of something formidable. A crisis like of which has never been known on earth. The memory of the most profound clash of consciences and the passing of a sentence upon all that which theretofore had been believed, exacted and hallowed. I am not a man, I am dying. <laughs>